here's what you could have won. Car Obsession is proudly supported by Carly and Draggy. Check out the video description to find out the latest discount codes. The Mark II sat down Cupra with 240 horsepower and 300 newton meters on tap it's far from what you'd call slow. However, with cars such as the Ford Focus RS and the Renault Megane RS hitting the scene at the same time, Seat had to fight back in the hot hatch war, and this, the Leon Cooper R, was the result. Whoa, whoa. This may have the same 2-litre turbocharged 4-cylinder EA113 petrol engine as the standard Cupra, but of course it has been fettled and tuned. Thanks to a tweak to the ECU, as well as a change to the turbo boost pressure, this car offers 265 horsepower along with 350 newton meters of torque. Other changes to this car include a revised high-pressure fuel pump, changes to the gear ratios and this car is stiffer as well. So needless to say, the SEAT team have done quite well to turn this car up to 11. Then you've got the look of the car itself. It may look like a standard Cupra, but look closer and you'll see some decent enhancements. Oh, this is good in the corners. This car is riding on 19 inch alloys, which is larger compared to the standard car and at the time if you paid say it's a bit of extra money you could have them painted in white like I have on this car to give you a bit of a retro flavor. At the back I've got a glossy black diffuser which is home to two exhausts which sits there proudly like two great big trumpets. I love it. Oh that noise. It is addictive. This car may not be quite as leery in its appearance as the Ford Focus RS, but I would say this car has struck the balance just about right. It's not too leery, but it's not too discreet. Now, speaking of the Focus RS, I must confess that is faster than 62 miles per hour, but only by 0.3 seconds. And are you going to notice that on a day-to-day -day basis? I highly doubt it. Speaking of which, this car, the Cupra R, will do 62 miles per hour in 6.2 seconds, and the top speed is 155 miles per hour. On paper, this car clearly has the right ingredients, but is this spicy paella undercooked? Well, it's my job to find out. Oh, all in a day's work. I love it. The engine response is really impressive. You've got a wide band of power, and although the six-speed gearbox is lovely to use the changes are slick precise and pretty mechanical you don't need to use the six speed as much as you may anticipate by the way in the uk at least you couldn't have a dsg but because the torque and the horsepower has got such a nice wide band to it the engine's power is really flexible very usable you can quite happily leave it in sixth gear and still overtake on the motorway without having to change down it's quite a muscular engine, and as you accelerate, you get a nice snarl as you climb towards that red line. It is an impressive power plant, and definitely one of the standout features of this car. Now, for those of you that don't know, the EA113 engine is actually the predecessor to the iconic EA888 engine which is still in use today and is featured in cars such as the Volkswagen Golf R, the Audi S3 and the Cupra 4 Mentor to name but a few. A pretty good bloodline I'm sure you'll agree. There's no turbo lag that I can detect. Like I say it is a responsive engine just tickle the accelerator 
and this car is ready to rocket towards the horizon. Unlike the Focus RS, the Cupra R doesn't get a limited slip differential. No, instead, it gets a Volkswagen's XDS, which is an electronic differential lock. Put simply, it breaks the inside wheel during cornering to give better traction and to reduce the understeer. Does it work, though? Let's find out. Oh, I'll tell you what, through the corners, the Cupra R is very impressive. Now, I own a standard Land Cupra, and although that is now modified, I remember how it used to perform when it was standard, and the R in comparison, as you would expect, it just feels sharper, more focused, more racy. It's almost like sending a human to boot camp, they come back fitter, more chiselled, and this is kind of the same thing. The brakes perform well. Okay, they do feel a tad over-assisted, but they are strong, so I've got no complaints there. As I mentioned earlier, this car is stiffer compared to the standard Cupra, and as a result, yes, it needs better handling, but the ride, it is most definitely unsettled. Now, at this kind of speed down this kind of road, it isn't too bad, but when you're driving it at town speeds, on poor roads, it gives you some idea of what it would be like to balance jelly whilst jumping on a trampoline. Yeah, it's very unsettled. Could you daily this car? Yes, you could, but if you want something that's more rounded and easier to live with when it comes to ride comfort, I would strongly recommend that you have a look at the Golf GTI instead. That would be a more rounded proposition. But if you want something that's rarer, more special, and of course faster, then this is the one you want. Whilst the ride is firm, there is a saviour, and that is the front sport seats, which as standard on the Cupra R, are finished in leather. They're comfortable and they hug you in the right places. They are a very good sport seat. They are arguably, in my opinion, the stars of the interior as well, which isn't exactly pound land but it, it isn't exactly the Ritz either. If you want a nicer interior again I'd recommend the Golf GTI but at least because this is a facelift the interior is a bit more modern compared to the pre-facelift which looks dated to say the least. Now whilst I've got my sensible shorts on, I think these are my sensible shorts, let me speak about fuel economy which I know, I know, I know is a boring topic but given the fact that nowadays you have to remortgage your house just to get a tank of fuel, I think it is quite an important topic. So on a combined run, SEAT states that this is good for 34.9 mpg, but do bear in mind, I'm pretty sure that it's using the old NEDC method of testing, which is defunct because it wasn't very realistic. In regard to CO2 emissions, this emits 190 grams per kilometer. Now, I've mentioned the fuel economy, but what have I been getting? Well, looking down at the trip computer, it doesn't make for good reading. Yes, I have been uh, spanking this car around a bit, but I'm currently doing 21.6 mpg. Yes, not 31, 21.6. Now, in the, in the sake of fairness, on my drive to my filming location, I was getting low 30s, but yeah, the moment you drive this car how it's meant to be driven, like this, but bear with me. Oh. As you can imagine, the fuel economy, the MPG, will plummet like a car that's been driven off a cliff. Well, though, if you ever drove a car off a cliff, you'd be saving fuel. Top tip, if you want to save fuel, Drive your car, no, I'm joking. I would never recommend that. I kind of wish I'd bought a Cupra R. Yeah, this does feel a little bit bittersweet to this drive. Do you remember on Bullseye, I know that's a very old reference by the way, uh, dare I say before my time somewhat, but do you remember on Bullseye, if you do remember it, 
when they said, here's what you could have won. That's kind of what it feels like when I'm driving this car. I'm sat here in this very nice leather bucket seat thinking, maybe I should have saved up a bit more money and bought an R. Hmm. Well, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Hindsight is a beautiful thing. Before I get too caught up in what could have been, let me give you some info to those of you who could be looking to buy the Cooper R. At current market prices, you're looking in the region of £8,500 to £15,000, although at the time this video was edited, there were just seven available in the whole of the UK on AutoTrader. In regard to what you get as standard, that includes R styling, 19 inch alloys, bi xenon headlights with auto function, electric folding door mirrors, leather seats, front and rear parking sensors, dual design climate control, cruise control, Bluetooth, navigation, and CD player to name a few. With it being a hatchback, it offers a decent amount of practicality, even more so when you consider this car is five door only. The boot offers 341 litres, which is about right for this class, although some rivals did offer a larger boot. Rear space isn't overly generous, especially if you happen to be blessed with height, like myself, I'm six foot two, so you may want to bear that in mind. There are a few decent cubbies here and there in the cabin, so it shouldn't be too tricky to store items away whilst on the move. Now before I wrap things up, which I don't really want to do because as you can tell, I've had a lot of fun making this video, I'd like to talk about how this car has been like to live with for the week. Now, to put simply, this is an easy car to get along with. Yes, the ride is firm and where I live, the roads are awful, I live in, live in Worthing. So when you're driving around town, it gives you some idea of what it would be like to be bounced about until your spleen is detached from your body. But when you get to get onto faster, more flowing roads like this, which are slightly better, it isn't too bad. I do find that Bluetooth is a bit slow to connect to my phone, which is a first world problem, but it is a bit of an annoyance as well. And I do have another issue, which may well be personal to me, but bear with me. Now I own a Mark II Leon Cupra, a pre-facelift, therefore not an R. And that, in comparison to this, the clutch pedal is in a different place. And I don't mean it's located in the boot, that would be stupid. But what I mean is on the, on the facelifted car, weirdly, the clutch pedal has been moved to the left closer to the center console. And you may be asking, okay, well, what's the problem there? It seems like a weird thing to say. Well. For me in particular, and this may affect you, I find that I've got less space in which to put my foot on the footrest, and when it is on the footrest, it's kind of squeezed between the centre console and the cl clutch pedal. Admittedly, I do have large feet, they're size 11, and you know what they say about men with big feet. Yes, big socks. Um, but I'm wearing my Converse today, which are quite narrow, and yeah, my foot isn't comfortable, and when I go to change gear, I have to kind of squeeze my foot between the gap of the centre console and the clutch pedal, change gear, then put my foot back. And that whole process, it just puts a strain on my left knee and makes it ache. Yes, I do have a chronic knee injury from my years of goalkeeping, but yeah, I don't think I could drive this car on a longer distance, so I just think it would really just ruin my left knee. In the UK, I'm not too sure about Europe, I think you could get these with a DSG in Europe, but I may be wrong, but in the UK, these are only manual. So to sum up the Seat Leon Cooper R, this is a very, very good hot hatchback, but I can see why it might not be to everyone's tastes. For example, the Megane RS is a better driver's car, if I'm going to be honest. It's not as well-rounded as a Golf GTI, and it hasn't got the same kind of allure or desirability of a Focus RS. So I, I would say this is not so much a niche choice, but I would argue it is a very interesting choice and it is a proper pity that there aren't more of these on the road. But if you do happen to own one of these, then I applaud you because you have chosen a very, very good hot hatch. 
A massive thank you to Say It UK for loaning me the car for the week and of course a massive thank you for you guys watching this video. If you have enjoyed it, be sure to like, comment and subscribe. If you are subscribed, don't forget to click the bell icon so you get notified every time I make a video. But until the next time guys, be sure to keep up the car obsession. <laughs>